And thanks ever so much to James and UK Rio for inviting um, Chris and I along. So just to introduce myself, um, my name is Dr. Rebecca Barnes. Um, I'm a senior qualitative advisor at the um, National Institute for Health and Care Research's Research Support Service Hub delivered by the University of Leicester and Partners. And I also lead nationally on equality, diversity and inclusion across the RSS. And just to hand over to Chris to introduce himself. I am Chris Newby and I'm a senior quantitative advisor at the same RSS as Becky and um, I'm also a medical statistician. Perfect, thank you. And we will explain a little bit more about what the RSS is um, as we go along. But the focus of our presentation is going to be on how um, researchers can embed equity and inclusion throughout the research cycle. So this is from conceiving of the initial idea right through to achieving and capturing research impact. And where we're coming from is the premise that it is vital to ensure that research involves and benefits and reaches the groups of people who need it most. And that is particularly groups who've been traditionally excluded from research and who sometimes have also been harmed by research in a range of different ways. Now, a couple of caveats um, is that our presentation is particularly relevant to empirical research with um, human participants, and also it's developed from health and social care um, research. And so that might be reflected in some of the terminology that we use, um, but we do think that there is plenty in here that's transferable to other disciplines as well. So the um, first kind of area to address is the scope of what we mean by equity and inclusion. And so we know that sometimes equity and inclusion are kind of restricted to the protected characteristics in the Equality Act. Um, but in addition to um, those nine protected characteristics, um, because we work um, for the National Institute for Health and Care Research, which is the largest funder of health and care research in the UK, um, there are some other areas that are particularly relevant um, for the NIHR and, and indeed for equalities generally. So social class and socioeconomic position is one such area whether people have caring responsibilities is really key, um, neurodiversity, literacy, and also the NIHR um, and some other organizations talk a lot about underserved groups. So groups that are particularly marginalized, disadvantaged, discriminated against, and that includes groups such as prisoners, um, traveler communities, homeless people, um, asylum seekers and refugees, um, to name but a few examples. We're also very interested in geography, and there are two dimensions to this, both where research is carried out. Um, often research focuses on major urban centers rather than looking at the experiences um, that people have or how services are delivered in rural, coastal or suburban areas, but also understanding the geography of how funding is distributed for research and how often um, that's not an equitable distribution. We're also very mindful of career stage, um, and sector for researchers and recognizing that early career researchers and precariously employed researchers can face particular challenges and that researchers outside of academia, so those who are in um, some clinical um, specialisms, public health, social care, um, can face particular challenges and barriers um, as well. But what's also really important is to be aware of intersectionality, that we will all fit into a number of these different categories and that the ways in which um, different identities and characteristics intersect can lead to a kind of exacerbation of inequalities and, and exclusion. So what we're going to move on to next um, are kind of some actionable and practical steps to think about embedding equity and inclusion in your research. And I'm going to hand over to Chris for this. Thank you, Becky. So we're introducing 10 steps to embedding equity and inclusion in research. Um, we don't have huge amounts of time. We could spend a kind of uh, um, hot an hour on each one, if you like, or um, exploring it. But we'll go through it pretty quickly just to cover nearly everything at a quite a lot of quick pace. So uh, next slide, please. So what we do at the RSS is we kind of um, advise um, on, met on methodology in um, people's research applications for medical research at the NIHR. And that's our main bread and butter. And one thing we found was that um, people are making kind of EDI statements um, around what they're going to do in their research, but then it's sometimes not backing it up. And um, so people will say, oh, well, I'll recruit a diverse sample, but then actually not saying how they're going to do that they've done it before 
who on the team will um, do that work? Will that take longer time? All those kind of things. It's a team experience with that or skills, or maybe they need some training to do that. So it's this is really about substantiating the kind of research claims that you're making in there and kind of making sure it's all kind of um, uh, sorted and thought about, basically. So that's what we do kind of hopefully right at the beginning of the application and to get that embedded in. Um, next slide, please. And then this is step two. And it's uh, basically... In uh, the research applications, people have to justify the problem that they're researching. So um, people will say how big this problem is, usually in terms of numbers and statistics. So they'll say this many people are affected in the UK or it costs this amount to the NHS um, in terms of hospital admissions or um, something like that, or how much it costs. Um, and But also we want to tease out the health inequalities in, in that area. Um, so what are these? These are looking at what's happened in the literature to um, groups that might have um, worse outcomes in terms of health outcomes or in terms of being more prevalent for the disease, having the disease um, to a larger extent in their population. So um, we want to know that you've looked at that and um, you've investigated it and then see how that's going to weave into your application, because if you don't make um kind of adjustments for um those people with the worst health inequalities you're kind of just backing them up in your in your in your own research so um yeah it's good to include that information around inequalities and to in get that to inform the rest of your research and the next step please um so include areas underserved so becky talked about this a little bit in the introduction so um what kind of sites are you doing? Usually we um, you want to do the research in your own site because you're aware of all the infrastructure around it and that's an easier option if you like or the best option to get started. But um, more and more we're wanting kind of diverse sites because we don't want something that just works on your local area. We want it to work and um, kind of be informed by lots of different areas. So maybe looking at where the problem is the worst in terms of geography, but also um, in that could be urban, coastal, rural. Um, but then also being aware that those other sites that you're hoping to recruit from um, might need more time to set up in terms of research ethics um, and um, governance. Um, and then putting in that time with those sites and also um, how much that's going to cost as well. Um, the next slide, please. Um, this is about just finding your research sample. So I'm a medical statistician, so I do some trials and some other cohort studies, but there's always an inclusion and exclusion uh, criteria for a study or a study sample, if you like, a sample of the population. Um, and um, it, people just kind of list these, and sometimes there are medical reasons around these, but other times, um, these inclusions or exclusions come from our own biases. So one exclusion that we see quite a bit is sometimes that um, people are excluded because they don't speak English or English is their first language. Um, but this can be easily um, accounted for by using translation services um, that can be costed in. But then another um, exclusion one we see sometimes is for digital interventions where um, sometimes people who are older um, are excluded because the assumption there or the bias there in thinking is that they might not be as computer literate or, or digitally literate as um, younger people. But um, that's a big assumption. Not everyone's the same. So it's just about kind of um, criticising or critically thinking about those exclusion and inclusion criteria and um, making um, finding ways um, to accommodate everyone who can get into that sample. But some of these might be justified in um, for a medical reason. Um, yeah, so um, after you've kind of looked at that and um, you've kind of adjusted for um, your exclusion criteria and seen what you can make it more inclusive, um, you want to capture the characteristics of your sample um, in terms of um, protected characteristics or beyond protected characteristics. And that leads into our next uh, step. So this is around how to specify what data you're collecting on um, characteristics or demographics. And um, so uh, it's it can be quite um, tricky to 
ask this question of um, participants when you're recruiting, but there are um, guidance on this. And um, we've put a link here to a place where people have done a lot of work around how to collect this data or um, how to word it. Um, but people are usually willing to provide this data as long as they understand why you want it. Um, uh, are you just going to use it to kind of say, oh, look how great I am. I've, I've recruited a diverse sample, but also we're wanting you to kind of tease that out in the analysis. So for quantitative studies like I'm on, we could do a subgroup analysis for protected characteristics. So a lot of the big journals now are asking for um, subgroup analysis for gender and ethnicity. But that comes with um, some statistical problems because that wouldn't be powered. It's not a big enough sample to do hypothesis testing where you get some kind of p-value. Um, but we can just um, do subgroup analysis and not do hypothesis testing and leave the information, those summary statistics for people to see in the data. And um, people, so that data is out there and people can you, combine that with other data to, um, to make use of it. Um, but they also can be used in qualitative studies that um, Becky's more um, <laughs> interested in and um, that they can be used to kind of contextualize um, what people have said in there. But there's also cautions around anonymity, which is hard for me to say anonymity. And um, so um, because um, it can be identifiable, quotes can be identifiable and even kind of quantitative um, uh demographics can be identifiable if they're in small amounts, if you have lots of them combined. And I'll pass on to Becky for the next five steps. Thank you, Chris. So the um, sixth step is to budget for inclusion. Um, now, um, Chris and I both work um, for the National Institute for Health and Care Research, which has recently introduced research inclusion as a condition of funding. Um, and so that means that researchers are now expected to kind of have a special budget line for research inclusion and to justify all of those costs. And we recognize that different funders are at different places with this. Um, and so it might be um, particularly important for researchers to kind of spell out what kinds of costs they need to make the research inclusive, what the implications would be of not having um, these kinds of um, measures in place um, and to, to really make that case to funders. Um, now, what sorts of costs are we talking about? So um, our RDS um, EDI toolkit, which I'll talk about um, a little later on, um, gives some examples of the cost and time implications of conducting genuinely inclusive research. And that might be costs to make the research more accessible in terms of um, written research um, materials um, or videos um, or podcasts to present um, and disseminate the research and making sure that those are available in different formats or different languages where appropriate. It might be hiring um, rooms in community venues rather than expecting participants to travel up to a university or to a hospital um, site. Um, it might be kind of costs for respite care um, or childcare um, or support to um, kind of overcome digital exclusion. So there's lots of um, examples. And what it really requires is for um, funders and research development staff and researchers to recalibrate understandings of value for money, because we know from the researchers we support that they're worried about their bids being uncompetitive if they include the costs of inclusive research. But there really needs to be a cultural shift to seeing um, that research that isn't inclusive is uncompetitive and that um, the costs of inclusion shouldn't be seen as a kind of unaffordable or optional extra. Now, the next tip is to consider how methodological innovation could overcome the exclusionary aspects of conventional methods. And this stemmed from some earlier work that Chris and I did when we were developing the toolkit, and we were thinking about how some conventional methods could be made more inclusive and accessible. And it felt a little bit that, yes, there are things that you can do um, to work with um, interpreters, for instance, um, or to um, administer questionnaires to people that might find it difficult to complete those themselves. Um, but it felt that we were tinkering a bit at the edges of methods that just have quite a lot of exclusion um, and um, inaccessibility built into them. Uh, so a lot of methods expect people to be quite articulate and be able to sort of spontaneously and confidently talk about their views and experiences. Whereas thinking about kind of more participatory or creative methods, art space methods, photo voice, um, working with peer or community researchers, 
um, thinking about options such as remote or community-based monitoring if it's um, a clinical trial or another study that involves collecting follow-up data and um, can just help to um, you know, take down some of the barriers that stop people from participating. And then the eighth tip is to demonstrate how your research is being shaped by diverse and inclusive public involvement and engagement. So for funders such as the NIHR, um, public involvement is absolutely essential and is a, another kind of requirement for funding, um, whereas some other funders might focus more on public engagement um, rather than members of the public being involved throughout. But if, um, as a researcher, you're wanting to access diverse communities, um, it's really important to be involving people from those different communities to decide um, how best to reach and involve them and to do that in an equitable um, and an inclusive and respectful way and to do that from the outset of the project. If you are involving members of the public, it's important to consider their diversity, um, to be aware of having kind of mix of experiences as is appropriate to what your research question is, and also to be aware of sometimes people um, putting themselves up as a spokesperson for an entire community, which would be inappropriate. And we need to think about what the potential barriers to meaningfully involving people are and take steps to address those. And that will be different depending on the different populations that you're trying to involve. Now, the penultimate tip is to plan inclusive and impactful approaches to knowledge mobilization. And knowledge mobilization is the process um, by which research impact is realized. And it's not something researchers can do in isolation. They need to do it with um, stakeholders who are going to be the beneficiaries and users of the research. And this needs to take place throughout the whole research cycle. And again, it's absolutely key that those stakeholders are diverse um, so that we can find out um, what kind of knowledge different groups of people need, what messages will be relevant to them, and how to communicate those different messages in a way that's likely to increase um, their uptake to different groups and communities. And when we're thinking about pathway to impact, um, it's really valuable to think about the opportunity to consider tackling different inequalities as part of that pathway to impact and how you'd actually measure and demonstrate that. Now, the final step is to use the resources available to help you. And there are a whole plethora of different resources around EDI and research um, for different disciplines. Um, but the RDS, um, so that's Research Design Service, which um, was the precursor to the RSS EDI toolkit, is um, an, a resource that Chris and I have developed um, with input from um, many other people. So um, we worked with the RDS EDI Working Group um, and uh, the toolkit was piloted um, by three of the research design services at the time. And we also worked with a group of very supportive and enthusiastic um, public contributors. Um, and it's important to kind of acknowledge that although Chris and I are often the faces um, of this toolkit, um, there are lots of other people that have um, shared their lived experience um, and their professional um, experiences um, with us and we're indebted to them. Um, you can access the toolkit uh, through the QR code and I think there might be a link going into the chat shortly as well. Um, and what the toolkit does is to cover the different kind of um, domains, um, areas of the research cycle and provide useful resources, guidance, case studies. Um, now, if you're based in England or if you're based in one of the devolved nations of the UK, but you have English um, based partners, and if you're working in health and social care research, then another resource is the research support service. And we can provide you with free and confidential advice to develop funding applications um, for national um, funding. Um, so do have a look at the website um, and get in touch if you think that that might be useful um, to you. And I will um, end there and hopefully we've got a bit of time for any questions. <laughs>